In today's video, we are gonna be going back to Huananji B760 motherboard that I reviewed a few months ago. Since I made that video, I've been getting a lot of questions about whether it can handle powerful CPUs or not. And to be honest, that's something that I've been wondering as well. Which is why I decided to take it upon myself to conduct multiple tests and figure out if it can handle mid-range or even high-end CPUs and give you guys some recommendations and show you just how bad or how good the results are in the end. Let's begin with thermals. First, we're gonna measure the idle temperature. I'm gonna be using this infrared thermometer and I'll try to do my best at measuring different parts of the heat sinks that are cooling various components. At idle, the temperatures are pretty normal, as they should be. The top part of the heatsink that is basically cooling the MOSFETs is around 36 degrees, and the MOSFETs of the zoom are around 45 degrees. Now, the delta between the top of the heatsink's temperature and the actual temperature of the component that the heatsink is cooling is usually somewhere between 8 to 15 degrees, depending on how good the contact is obviously and how good the heatsink itself is. The chokes and the capacitors on the other hand are not being directly cooled by the heatsink, so the chokes were around 40 degrees when I measured them, the capacitors were 38, and the heatsink on top of the chipset was 48 degrees. Now let's start Cinebench R23 multicore stress test and see just how high the temperatures will go. After 5 minutes of Cinebench R23 multicore stress test, I saw somewhere between 60 to 70 degrees on the heatsink depending on where I was measuring the heatsink. Obviously, the top of the heatsink was lower temperature because heat takes time to reach higher parts of the heatsink. So the bottommost part of the heatsink that is cooling the MOSFETs here was around 70 degrees, while the top part was somewhere between 58 to 60, which is around 10 to 12 degrees delta. The chokes on the other hand reached around 60 degrees, which is still a quite decent temperature, and the capacitors reached 45 degrees. Again, nothing critical, nothing, you know, alarming, all of these temperatures are quite acceptable. And by the way, the chipset didn't really change temperature at all, at least not the heatsink itself. And now, let's see what the temperatures are like after 10 minutes of stress test. By the way, this CPU is drawing around 160 watts, which is quite a lot for this motherboard. And we're gonna notice right now that, yes, the heatsink is trying to cool the MOSFETs, but you know, in this case, and I didn't really think that this motherboard would be able to handle 160 watts, I started noticing that the temperature on the heatsink was climbing and the MOSFETs and basically all of the VRMs were getting really close to their critical temperature. And when I say VRMs, I mean all of the MOSFETs, the chokes and the capacitors, which is basically what the VRMs usually consist of. Anyway, after 10 minutes of stress test, I saw the MOSFETs go up to 90-ish degrees. The software was showing that the VRMs were reaching 90 degrees, and I think in this case the software is measuring the temperature of the MOSFETs, not chokes and capacitors. And so when I measured the heatsink after 10 minutes, I saw that the top of the heatsink was way hotter than before, and when I measured the bottommost part of the heatsink, it was around 80-ish degrees, which was, you know, pretty high for a heatsink, because that means that the components under the heatsink that is trying to cool are usually around 90 degrees or more. And since the chokes and capacitors are not being covered by any kind of heatsink or thermal pad, we can get direct temperature measurement on those components. So the chokes, which are basically part of the VRM, reached 70 degrees, which again is getting really close to critical temperature. And by critical temperature, I don't mean that, you know, something's gonna happen to it. Obviously, the lower the temperature, the better it's gonna be. And from my point of view, with my limited experience, I think the chokes should function around 80 degrees or lower. And the capacitors, you usually want them to be way lower temperature, like 60 or 65 degrees or lower. And MOSFETs usually function on way higher temperature, 
same for the chipset. By the way, the chipset didn't really go over 60 degrees at any point, so the chipset was fine at all times, which I cannot say about the MOSFETs because when I saw the heatsink reach 82 degrees, I think it was around 80, maybe 82 degrees, that means the MOSFETs were around 90 degrees, which is exactly what the software was showing. Now, it didn't really say what the thermometer was measuring in the software, but I could assume that it was for the MOSFETs, but anyway, fast forward after 15 to 17-ish minutes, I'm seeing the heatsink reach 86-88 degrees, which is really high at this point, and the software is showing that the MOSFETs are reaching 100 degrees. At this point, I'm already seeing the CPU being throttled down in frequency, which means that the motherboard is being overheated and it clearly cannot handle this CPU. 160 watts is a bit too much for this motherboard. So 17 minutes after full stress in Cinebench R23, I'm seeing 100 degrees on the MOSFETs, 80 plus degrees on the chokes, which again is pretty high, and 60 plus degrees on capacitors, which is kinda acceptable but still kinda high. And the chipset is fine, it is around 60 degrees. So after seeing these temperatures, I was like, hmm, these temperatures are kinda high, so let me just stop the process because I don't want anything to get damaged because the temperatures are clearly too high. So then I went into the BIOS and limited the CPU power to 120 watts. At which point I saw the temperature of the MOSFETs or the VRMs that was being measured by the software drop by around 20 degrees, which was amazing. So if the MOSFETs are running at 80 degrees, that means the chokes and the capacitors are way lower temperature, like 70, 60 or even 50 degrees. Now, regardless of the limit, the games didn't really use more than 60, 80 or even 90 watts on the CPU. But in the end, I did still limit the CPU to 120 watts because in gaming, you really are not gonna notice too much or any difference at all because the games use around 60 to 90 watts, usually, on this CPU, I mean, not on every CPU, obviously. On this CPU, didn't really matter too much which GPU I used, well, unless I put in a 5090, but, you know, that's such a rare situation. In general, the GPU that people would normally pair with this CPU is usually something like an RX 6700 XT, an RTX 3070, RTX 3080, or even RTX 4070, or if you are an AMD fan, maybe an RX 6800 XT. Now, all of these GPUs will never make the CPU draw more than 100 watts. Well, unless you're loading into the game, which is, you know, really small portion of the gaming that you do in video games. And even in those cases, I didn't really see any change, to be honest. And yes, I was monitoring the wattage. You know, I checked Warhammer 40k, Space Marine 2, Witcher 3 and, you know, various games. But I never saw the CPU go over 120 watts. So what is my conclusion from all that? I think that if you limit this CPU to 120 watts, oh by the way I forgot, I tried to underwatt this CPU, but you know sadly the option is there, you know it exists, but it didn't let me undervolt the CPU, it didn't let me do anything with voltage, you know, I couldn't lower or increase the voltage, I couldn't do anything with it. But if you wanna use this CPU in this motherboard, this is an i5-12600KF, it's a 160W CPU, it has 10 cores, 6 of which are performance cores, which is the important ones, the powerful cores, and 4 of those 10 cores are efficiency cores, which are basically assisting the performance cores, or P cores in this case, and in terms of threads, we have 16. So this is a quite powerful CPU. Naturally, it can boost up to 4.9 GHz, which is pretty high. And from what I saw, it draws somewhere between 60 to 100 watts in gaming, and I try to cool this CPU with a 90mm air cooler, which is pretty small, but you know, you guys don't necessarily need a water cooler to cool a CPU like this, especially if you limit it to 120 watts, which is what I did in games.
Do I actually recommend using a powerful CPU such as this in this motherboard? Well, not really, because we saw the temperatures go up to 100 degrees on the VRMs. So unless you're going to lock the wattage to 120 watts on this CPU, which you can do by doing this in the BIOS, set both PL1 and PL2 to 120,000. That means that it's gonna limit to 120 watts, which is what I did myself, and this is actually as much as I wanna recommend. If you try to use a CPU that is drawing more than 120 watts in this motherboard, I think it's gonna be a bit too much. The VRMs are gonna overheat and it is gonna degrade the motherboard really fast. And remember, it's not expensive, it is the cheapest B760 motherboard that you can find. You know, if you wanna use a better CPU such as an i7-12700K or even an i9, you really should consider buying a better motherboard. So let's make a summary. You can use all of the i3s on this motherboard. I also recommend an i5-13400F or 13500 and I recommend i5-14400F. These are very simple CPUs and even though some of them have many cores, such as the 13th or 14th gen i5s, they don't boost too high so they are kinda acceptable. By the way, bear in mind that I'm kinda expecting you guys to have somewhat of a good airflow in the case. An example is 3 fans as an intake and at least 1 fan as an exhaust. That is what I expect an average case to have. So if you guys have that much airflow in the case, I think it's acceptable to have these CPUs installed into this motherboard. But if you wanna use something a bit more demanding, like an i5-12600KF, I think it's gonna be a bit too much, unless you limit the power to 120 watts. Same goes for literally any other better CPU, such as any i7 or any i9. It's not so much about which CPU you use. If you limit the wattage to 120 watts on any CPU, it technically should be fine on this motherboard. But you know, if you have the money to buy an i9, why are you using this motherboard to begin with? You know, that's the question I would ask. But generally speaking, I do not recommend any i7 or i9s in this motherboard, but if you are using any of the i5s, it's fine. But remember, if you are using the K versions of an i5, do limit the wattage to 120 watts, otherwise it's gonna be a bit too much for the VRMs. They are budget, but they are acceptable, but more importantly, the heatsink isn't that amazing. It's alright for the price that you paid for the motherboard, but remember, this is a really budget motherboard. As long as you don't, you know, ask too much of it, it's gonna handle any of the i5s or i3s. Well, obviously, i3s are really easy to run. But either way, I hope this info was useful to you. I tried my best to test as much as possible. I've been using this motherboard for nearly half a year. I'm gonna be using it for more for my future tests. This has actually become my test bench because, you know, I wanna test this motherboard with various hardware and I don't really own a test bench and I always wanted to have a test bench to test my GPUs or newer Intel CPUs for, you know, whatever reason. For example, if I'm making a video, I wanna have a semi-decent setup to test a GPU or something, so yeah, I'm gonna be using this CPU and the motherboard as my test bench and if anything changes for better or worse I'm gonna let you guys know you know what happened but for now this is all I have to offer thank you so much for watching and as always I'm gonna see you guys in the next one bye bye